Spencer Overton is the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, a nonprofit think tank that helps develop ideas to improve the socioeconomic status of blacks in America. Currently, the Joint Center is focused on developing solutions to equip black workers with skills to succeed in the evolving economy. Spencer, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. You know, as public and private institutions and organizations look to a post-pandemic recovery, there's a lot of emphasis on what kind of skills are needed to get people back to work. And there's very much a focus on how to make this recovery equitable to everyone. And today I want to talk to you about the specific challenges and the unique challenges facing Black workers and job seekers as they try to find their way back as well. Can you kind of paint a picture for us and tell us what a what are some of the challenges facing the communities both before and now? Sure, Ramona. Thanks so much. So we, there were problems even before the pandemic, Ramona. We looked at this issue uh, first in 2017. We found that 27% of African-American workers were concentrated in just 30 jobs at high risk to automation. So you think about the kiosk that may be coming at the grocery store and the challenges that might pose to cashiers or checking luggage at the airport and the, the kiosk. So automation that was coming in. Uh, more recently, we looked at 10, a list of 10 top jobs. Now these 10 jobs, Ramona, are the most popular black jobs. In other words, there are more African-American workers in these jobs than any other jobs. Now that list of 10 overlaps with another top 10 list. And that's the top 10 list of jobs that will displace the most workers by 2030, pulled together by McKinsey. There are six jobs on the African-American most popular list that are also on that list of top 10 jobs that are, are going to uh, uh, yield the most jobs or displace the most people as a result of automation. So if we think about cashiers, food preparation, retail sales, customer service reps, uh, office clerks, these types of jobs. And when McKinsey looked at it, they found that 23% of African Americans as a whole would be displaced by automation by uh, 2030, uh, which was higher than white Americans and higher than Asian Americans. Ramona, even when we look at other jobs on that list that aren't at risk to uh, high risk to automation, jobs like home health care workers or personal care aides, you know, often these jobs have low wages uh, and few benefits. So if we look at a median uh, national earnings of about $52,000 a year. These jobs are at about $25,000 uh, a year. And, and overall, about 45% of African Americans have a high school diploma or, or less. Uh, and, uh, and, and they average about $28,000 a year uh, in terms of uh, earnings. Uh, and so the, the point here is that uh, what will we do uh, with this large number of workers who they will either be displaced by automation and, and, and even if they're not displaced by automation, how can we ensure that they have a brighter future, jobs with, that are better paid with, with, with benefits? You know, one of the characteristics that you talked about in those jobs that are at risk of automation and a characteristic of the black workers holding those jobs is education. Uh, the just almost half being uh, high, having high school diplomas or less. Where Where is the inequity? What's causing that correlation to happen in, because of the education system? Well, there are a couple of things that we need to talk about. You know, certainly skills are incredibly important and ensuring that their pathways to getting uh, credentials uh, is, is incredibly important. And if we look back at the Great Recession 
Uh, this is 2008, 2009. We, we know that African Americans were disproportionately affected because the jobs that came back often required credentials. Uh, 99% of the over 11 million jobs created uh, after the uh, 2008 recession went to workers with some college education. And, uh, and, and black folks were uh, disproportionately disadvantaged as a result of that. So as we think about this recovery, the same thing could possibly happen. Right now, about 20% of black adults uh, over 25 have a college degree. Uh, another 10% have an associate's degree or a credential uh, beyond high school. The objective here should be to uh, double both. Uh, we should reject this false choice between skills and college, and we should ensure that more folks have degrees so that we're uh, getting in that area of about 60% of African Americans having a high quality uh, degree or credential. That should be uh, the, the goal here. And again, uh, the goal should not be based on uh, fixing some broken black people. The problem isn't broken black people. The problem is really broken systems uh, here. We need to fix these systems. And again, the goal should not be to be with, you know, that the median American or to match white folks. The goal should be, you know, OECD standards, world standards. Those are our goals to really reach uh, the human potential uh, of uh, the African-American community uh, as opposed to simply uh, addressing racial disparities. There's no reason that African-American communities can't really leapfrog ahead when we talk about skills and credentials. There's a growing trend toward not having to have the degree, but to have, as you said, credentials, certifications, something to signal to an employer that uh, you are capable of doing the job, that you have the skills. Are, are you seeing any programs or any policies that are underway in the country that are helping ensure that Black Americans are getting those credentials that they need and they are having access, there, there's removal of the barriers for them? Sure. Well, there are a couple of important things here. One is uh, career pathways in terms of being very clear with stackable credentials about how to pull together uh, your own uh, career. So when we talk about, for example, that personal care aide who makes $23,000 a year, how can we get them that, uh, a, you know, that, that credential that will allow them to be a surgical technologist? Or how can we uh, help them and, and make, you know, about $47,000 a year? And how do we give them the information so that they know uh, what associate's degree they need to get to become a pediatric nurse and make $71,000 a year or uh, a BA uh, and, and become a, a nurse manager and make about $100,000 a year. So career pathways and that kind of information, that is important. Another important piece here is would be resources. Uh, we did a survey uh, 500 African Americans, 500 Latinos, 500 whites, 500 Asian Americans across the country uh, focused on the future of work. And we found that a significant barrier to all groups, uh, particularly African Americans, was money. Uh, this notion of money being the most significant barrier that each group cited in terms of obtaining skills. So increasing funding for HBCUs, for community colleges, vocational training, uh, increasing incentives for employers to provide on-the-job training, uh, to give uh, them tax credits and, and better tax incentives for employer-provided uh, training, uh, those issues are important. I do want to emphasize that skills are incredibly important, but there are other factors going on when we're talking about race. Uh, so, for example, you know, one foundational study showed that a resume with a so-called white name is 50% more likely to receive a callback than an identical resume with an African-American name. Uh, another study uh, uh, found that 
African-American job applicants who whiten their resumes by, by scrubbing them of any racial clues are two and a half times more likely to get a job call back. Uh, another study by economist Derek Hamilton shows that white households headed by someone without a high school diploma have more wealth on average than black households headed by someone with a college degree. So even if black folks had equal or superior skills and credentials, it seems from the existing data that disparities would still exist. So we definitely need to focus on skills, education, and credentials. They're very important, but we also need to focus on these other systemic factors as well to remove barriers for economic mobility for uh, Black communities. You know, I think what's very disturbing about those numbers are they probably are from the past several years, decades. It's not something that's just happening now, but does it seem that there's any improvement? I, I feel that in the last year, with all that's gone on, the Black Lives Matter movement has at least brought this to the surface. Do we see any progress there? Well, I think I'm encouraged, Ramona, about the notion of more Americans recognizing uh, systemic problems. So as opposed to relegating uh, discrimination to kind of the KKK member or the person who has this kind of this evil intent, recognizing that, you know, systems perpetuate inequity. So I'll give you an example. The GI Bill, which is, you know, said to lift all boats, uh, passed after World War II to help returning vets, a great bill, but it actually increased racial disparities because African-American veterans couldn't access uh, the tuition benefit because of uh, segregation in the South and because up North they had quotas in terms of the number of Black folks who could go to particular universities. And then also the housing benefit. Uh, African-Americans, because of racially restrictive covenants, couldn't buy in white areas. Uh, and because of redlining, uh, the mortgage benefit wasn't available in African-American areas. And so two of the prime ways of, of building wealth, home ownership and acquiring a college degree, uh, were really not available to the same degree to, to African-Americans. And, and you have a GI Bill that increases disparities. If we look at the more recent relief to the pandemic, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program for businesses, very few African-American businesses uh, uh, took advantage of the program relative to white businesses because it was really designed for businesses needing to take out larger loans. So uh, community uh, development, financial institutions, for example, were underutilized. Uh, they over-indexed in terms of serving Black businesses. So this really gets down to are our, our systems, our programs, our policies really designed to support and help uh, African-American businesses, African-American workers. It's not just, you know, was there this mastermind scheme to exclude uh, African-Americans? And that's obviously been a problem, uh, you know, at some points in our history. But it's also, are we deliberately inclusive in terms of our policies? Some of the research that you've done at the Joint Center has focused on the rural Black America. You've identified 156 counties that are over 35% um, Black population. Does this create even more challenges? What's going on in these areas right now? We looked at the Black rural South. We looked at counties in the United States that were over 35% African American and were designated as rural by the USDA. There were some unique things about uh, those counties. Number one, uh, today, uh, there was significant poverty in those counties. 52% uh, of uh, Black children live in poverty. We found that unemployment 
was almost three times higher. We also found significant racial disparities. So for example, we found that the typical white person's income was likely to actually be higher in the black rural South than it was in the area that we call the white rural South, which would be counties that are over 90% white. Right. So white folks who are living in the black rural South are actually doing better than the typical white person in uh, a, a more uh, homogeneous, less diverse place, uh, part of the rural South uh, here. We found uh, extensive, almost half of African-Americans not having home broadband uh, here. So just extensive uh, disparities there. And, and what was unique about the Black Rural South was this negative job growth here. The region has lost 100,000 manufacturing jobs. 40% uh, of the manufacturing jobs in the Black Rural South have been lost in the last 20 years. Uh, McKinsey took a look at job growth. And while they found that job growth in places like Seattle or these kind of job creation engines that we think of was about uh, 17, 16, 17, 18%. And it found job growth in typical rural areas about 1%, healthier rural areas. In the Black Rural South, it found negative job growth. In fact, negative job growth of 9% uh, percent by 2030, which means that even if you have skills in the Black Rural South, it's difficult to get a job. So if you're displaced by automation, it's just, it, it's harder to get a job because there are fewer jobs and the number of jobs are constantly dis decreasing. It's kind of like you're playing musical chairs and uh, when the music stops, there's one less chair. So, hey, you're, you're out of a job. You've been displaced by automation. If you're in a metro area that's growing, it's more likely you'll be able to find a job. If you're in the Black Rural South, even if you have skills, even if you have credentials, it's more difficult to find a job. It, it sounds like a, also a cycle that businesses go to communities where people have skills, but if you're having trouble upskilling enough people uh, because of education and training problems, you're going to have this vicious cycle of poverty and joblessness. So Ramona, I agree with you, but I would say that this is a national problem that we haven't grappled with and we haven't addressed. We haven't fixed it. It's been with us a long time. Uh, it's certainly uh, a part of the problem in the Black Rural South, but it's also a problem when we look at places like Appalachia. It's a problem when we look at places like uh, the Mississippi, the, the Delta uh, region from Illinois all the way down to the Gulf. These are places where there was a, a major industry. They needed a lot of labor. They needed a lot of people at one time. Uh, over time, the industries have become automated, but people still live there. And we haven't figured out as a nation how to deal with this, how to redeploy, reskill people. Uh, we just haven't figured it out. And, and that is really our challenge. And I'll tell you, Ramona, it's not just a problem of a particular company. Uh, you know, even though the private sector has to play a role, it's not even the problem of a particular state because a West Virginia can't deal with this issue completely by itself. It really is a national issue and we can't simply rely on phenomena like uh, the Great Migration where a number of African Americans just migrated basically uh, north and to other parts of the country to both engage in terms of the Industrial Revolution, in terms of jobs, uh, and then also to escape uh, Jim Crow, uh, you know, that caused the Great Migration. We really need, you know, more coherent national policies to actually uh, address this problem that we see in several localities and, and arguably what we're seeing it in the industrial Midwest as well as, as more jobs are, more manufacturing jobs 
are uh, shipped overseas. Do you have any specific recommendations for the incoming administration on how to address these issues nationally? The new administration needs to focus on a number of things. One is making uh, skill attainment credentials accessible to people, uh, accessible to a, a broad group of people. Uh, that's through tax incentives in terms of employers. Uh, that's by, uh, you know, issues like uh, free vocational training and community college, dealing with some of the financial issues. But it's also about dealing with the holistic nature of this. Uh, people face a number of challenges, whether it's transportation or child care or other issues. And we have to develop policies to help people uh, address those challenges. So uh, that is one. I think the systemic piece that we talked about in terms of recognizing that there are some regional challenges that exist and what are we going to do? How are we going to deploy uh, uh, solutions in, in terms of these regions that are, are suffering? Uh, another big piece is recognizing and, and focusing and, and not ignoring race in designing policies. Uh, we've talked about the shortcoming of uh, some policies and how they fail uh, particular communities and particular African-Americans. So being conscious about how policies actually play out as opposed to simply saying uh, it's race neutral and therefore it's fine. I think we need to recognize, Ramona, that these problems will not be uh, solved overnight. They haven't been created overnight. The problems won't be uh, solved overnight. So I think uh, that's a big piece. I think another thing is when we look at the history of places like the Black Rural South, uh, a place where we've got a new innovation, the cotton gin, in the late 1700s and really the first six decades of the 1800s, uh, the spread of cotton and uh, slave labor and, and really undercutting China and India in cotton production uh, on the backs of uh, enslaved workers. Uh, and you know that during that time, uh, cotton was half of our exports. So really we became an economic superpower quickly because of uh, slavery. Uh, and then when we move over to Jim Crow, this wasn't just about, you know, social segregation or inferior nature of African Americans. Um, uh, Jim Crow was also about keeping captive a cheap workforce uh, minimizing competition from African Americans and also really keeping a, a low wage, cheap uh, black workforce to continue to work on cotton. And we saw some of the same practices that occurred as manufacturing uh, was expanded in the uh, black rural South. And so as cotton uh, harvesting became automated, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and we saw a shift to manufacturing. Again, it was about low wages uh, here. You can pay, bring your jobs here. Uh, and even now, when we talk about the spread of, of you know, industries like casinos, et cetera, you know, the, the argument is, you know, low taxes, uh, low wages, et cetera. And you know, as we move forward, we need to invest in human beings. Uh, the problem with the strategy, the economic strategy, let's put aside the morality of it, but the problem with the economic strategy has been there's been a lack of investment in human beings. And when we think about the world and moving forward in terms of the world and having a, a talented, a creative, high-skilled workforce, that's not the solution in terms of us being a leader in the world in terms of the United States. It's not going to come from a low-skill, low-wage workforce. It's going to come from uh, a workforce that has skills where we're really investing in the human potential 
and we're recognizing the human potential uh, of uh, all communities. Certainly a lot of Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, a big meaning of it is to recognize the humanity of black life that you know black life it matters uh, here and so we really want to recognize the humanity and as opposed to simply saying let's profit by keeping wages low for this class recognizing the humanity of people investing in them in terms of their talent their skills and investing in them as human beings so, Spencer, what is the impact of the pandemic on Black communities and Black workers? Well, you know, the pandemic, and I would even say the killing of George Floyd and many others have highlighted racial inequity. Uh, you know, we certainly we can address policing, and that's important, but inequality will still exist. Uh, addressing economic inequality uh, is also a, a critical part of systemic inequality. Uh, we see the pandemic accelerating many changes that were already in process. So uh, when we think about incentives that companies have for uh, new technologies that are transforming work, including a shift to online sales, the spread of cashless uh, checkout, uh, uh, the, the use of autonomous robots, uh, the heightened digital surveillance of both customers and workers, the significance of digital skills, uh, the preference for high-skilled workers who have jobs uh, and where people can work remotely from home. Uh, all of those trends that are connected to the future of work, we've seen those really magnified uh, during the pandemic. And we see two categories of Black workers that come out of this uh, during the pandemic, either those folks who lost their job as a result of the pandemic and face economic insecurity, or we see a number of African Americans who were deemed essential workers and who have faced uh, health insecurity as a result of increased exposure to the virus. With regard to unemployment, uh, you know, in April, back in April, Black unemployment had spiked to almost 17%. Uh, that was almost 11 percentage points higher than the pre-pandemic rates. Uh, and, and right now, Black unemployment is still about twice what it was a year ago and is currently about five points higher than white unemployment. Uh, key economists project that about four million jobs are permanently lost, aren't, aren't coming back. In terms of essential workers, about one in six, one in six essential workers are African American. Uh, black workers are overrepresented as cashiers, uh, which is listed at the, as the most at risk job with low pay and high contact uh, to the virus. Uh, black workers are also overrepresented as nursing assistants, medical assistants, uh, cooks and restaurant workers, and food preparation supervisors uh, here. Uh, African Americans are overrepresented at a place like Amazon in terms of retail, where they're about a quarter of the workers, and at Walmart, where they're about one in five uh, workers. And the impact has been not just on workers, but we've seen this uh, throughout the economy. So, for example, uh, about uh, almost a third of Black homeowners are uh, likely to miss or defer mortgage payments. Uh, black businesses were disproportionately affected by the pandemic and had to close. Uh, and so we've seen these uh, real challenges in terms of the pandemic that have accelerated uh, the challenges posed by the future of work. So how does how does that compare to the impact of the Great Recession on Black America? Well, you know, the Great Recession, so this is the period around 2008, 2009, you know, it's similar to the pandemic in, in the sense that it reveals the fragility of African Americans, the economic uh, vulnerability. Uh, although incomes after the Great Recession recovered for 
white workers, black communities were left behind in terms of earnings, post-secondary attainment, household, earner, uh, household ownership, uh, net worth, uh, business ownership. Uh, 99 of the over 11 million jobs created in the post-recession economy went to workers with some college education. 72% uh, of those new jobs went to people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Black people were less likely to have these credentials and were less likely to get the new jobs that were created. So how do we ensure that this doesn't happen again as we try to recover from the pandemic economically? We have to ensure that our policies are designed to include all Americans. They can't be like the PPP program that really left black businesses behind. So as we think about skills and education, how can we ensure that all people have access to uh, new skills that allow people to get new good jobs? That's one piece. Uh, as we think about holistic supports people need in terms of transportation, child care, uh, how can we make sure that everyone has uh, access to that as we deal with infrastructure issues like broadband, uh, African Americans disproportionately lack home broadband. So how can we be very deliberate in ensuring that everyone is a part of the recovery? And, and this is an issue, Ramona, that doesn't just benefit African Americans. This isn't just a black problem. It's an American problem. Eliminating racial disparities, which uh, translate into an additional $2.7 trillion per year in the United States GDP, according to the Kellogg Foundation, uh, or that's a 13% boost to our GDP. It means more customers for businesses, more taxpayers to contribute to our collective obligations, and more innovation and creativity to ensure America leads the world in the new economy. So Spencer, what role can the private sector play in this recovery? Well, we certainly need good public policies to address systemic inequality in terms of the recovery. But the private sector also plays a key role. Fortune 500 companies alone represent two thirds of the GDP in the US and their decisions play a big role in whether disparities increase or whether they are eliminated. Uh, companies have uh, subcontractors and, and, and small businesses they work with. Uh, they also train a large number of people. They know what skills are going to be in demand in terms of the future. And they have a better idea of the direction of, of markets and, and skills, I think, than the, the public sector does. So the private sector certainly plays a significant role in terms of moving us forward. That said, uh, company A doesn't always want to you know, train someone and have them leave and go work for company B. So we can't just simply rely on uh, the private sector based on their own immediate financial interests to equitably train everyone and ensure that we have a skilled workforce. So the, the, the private sector has to play an important role, but it can't just be the private sector. The incentives aren't there. And also it can't just be individual states. We can't have states that are just competing against one another because Often some states don't want to train folks who leave and go to, let's say, another state uh, and take those skills away. So we, we, the federal government really has a role in coordinating with states and also with the private sector in ensuring that we have a, a great skilled workforce and also in ensuring that there's equity in those skills. The problems that have affected us in the past, uh, they can be undone. Uh, they're not likely going to be undone simply by writing a check to someone. Uh, they are going to be undone through deliberate public policies that ensure all Americans, including those who have been historically marginalized and left out, are a part of the a post-pandemic economy, 
are a part of the recovery. Bringing all these groups together, it'll take time. How much time? There are no easy answers. There's no silver bullet here. The problems that confront us, whether we're talking about, you know, conquest or whether we're talking about, uh, you know, America's initial rise as a global superpower when we talk about cotton, uh, you know, these problems have existed for uh, centuries. Uh, it really uh, is, is kind of arrogant to assume that we are going to solve them in five years or so 10 years here. They're going to take a while, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do our part. Uh, you know, A.C. Shad was an abolitionist and he worked on the Underground Railroad and he did his part and he did his share, but the challenges of his time they weren't solved uh, in the 1850s or the 1860s. They weren't even solved in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. So these problems may last beyond our lifetimes. It doesn't mean we shouldn't work on them. Certainly others before us, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Frederick Douglass uh, or you know, just a variety of people have worked on racial equity in making the war, the, the nation a better place. And, uh, you know, we all need to do our, our fair share. So are these problems and challenges that we see the result of only economics, the impact of economic change in our world? Well, innovation is important. It's a critical part of our country and the human spirit. It's a critical part of uh, new remedies and just moving forward in terms of evolution. It's important, but we also have to recognize their costs. There are costs in terms of the industrial revolution related to climate change. Uh, their costs in terms of the use of slave labor and creating an economic system, uh, based on, on, on slave labor. Uh, that, that's based on, on, on racial inequality that linger until today. These are not problems that are going to be solved in a quarter. There are long-term costs of uh, some of the past economic activities that we've gain, uh, engaged in. And as opposed to uh, sticking our head in the sand, uh, we've got to address them. We've got to confront them and and grapple with them you know part a healthy part of markets a healthy part of capitalism is recognizing uh, these uh, longer term costs and as opposed to externalizing uh, these costs on those people who are least prepared to, to address them or as opposed to externalizing them in terms of the environment and affecting uh, generations into the future, we've got to figure out how to uh, identify these costs and, uh, and solve them. And we've got incredibly smart, talented, innovative people. Uh, and just as new technology, just as innovation is used to uh, solve uh, problems uh, related to uh, something like COVID-19 or another challenge, uh, we can use innovation and new ideas uh, to solve the problems of uh, racial uh, inequality, uh, to solve the problems of uh, climate change, uh, to solve some of these other uh, costs of markets. So Spencer, what gives you hope that in the Black community, all that you have outlined and have talked about can be achieved? I'm inspired by all of the progress that I've seen in our nation in the last five years, the enthusiasm and the optimism of young people uh, being engaged and uh, taking themselves and their rights very seriously. Uh, I'm also inspired by places around the world that have been really transformed in a generation or so. If we think about places like 
South Korea or Rwanda, where there was great tragedy, or Estonia, we see uh, an investment in people, an investment in education, an investment in technology, and we see these uh, societies really leapfrogging forward uh, quickly uh, from an economic standpoint. And if that's something that can happen in South Korea, why can't it happen in Gary, Indiana? Why can't it happen in Baltimore or Detroit? I believe that it can. Uh, another thing that gives me hope is that uh, we've seen this before uh, in terms of, uh, I think about the movie like Hidden Figures, uh, African-Americans who are mathematicians, they recognize that computers are coming and they go out and they learn Fortran and, and, and teach Fortran to one another. And when the IBM comes, they're ready to take a leadership role in terms of the computers. And so we've seen this happen before. It's not new. I, I definitely believe in uh, uh, black communities. I definitely believe in the ability of Americans to reinvent themselves. And the question here is, are we going to commit to do that with regard to race in the United States? We all have a role to play. Certainly black community has a role, but all Americans have a significant role to play. Spencer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Ramona.